Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Dave Rowe. He's going to talk about the time that he spent playing bass for the great Jerry Reed. Well, I had moved here in December of 81 from my hometown of Honolulu, and I went to a jam session the first Monday I was in town, and somebody in the band, Paul Franklin, the, steel, the great steel player, called him up, and I was doing this slap funk stuff. You know, not, not that I'm great at it. I was just happened to be one of the first guys to get in town that could do that stuff. And and he was looking for that. And Paul called him that next morning and said, you need to hire this guy for your new band. And Reed called me. It was one of those crazy out random things. So, you know, they say this is a two, three year town before you get a gig or get, start making money. Man, I got so lucky. I got that gig. The first week I was in town, it was like amazing. So I did that. And one thing about playing with somebody as good as Jerry Reed, you never have to audition again. I came from a rhythm and blues background in Hawaii, but I love country music so much because of my mom's record collection that once every couple of years, I would put a country band together with the guys that were available that over there that could actually play the stuff. And we toured, which meant getting in the van and driving to all the military bases because around Oahu, because that was the only place you could play country music. So when I got here, and I actually was the first guy he hired for that new band. And uh, it was easy for me because I helped him do all the auditions that came up further. So by the time the band was formulated in its full, you know, in its f- full blownness, I uh, already knew all the stuff. It was easy. He was just funny and he was huge at the time. People for 10, you know, it's been 40 years now, but he was an arena act back then and a movie star and all that stuff. So that was my first taste of the big time. So. It was nothing but fun. It was great. Oh, God, he couldn't go on a truck stop at that point. We had to get food for him. I mean, we were, we we, we just didn't, we got to where we just didn't tell anybody who was on the bus because people would start mobbing the bus because he was big time because that was Smokey and the Bandit time and all that junk. He was on fire. Well, he was particular about gear in the sense that we were a 100% PV band because at the time PV dominated the South at least, you know. And I learned a lot of respect for that company because, man, they would just pull up to town and a semi and hand, it, hand out gear to all the uh, uh, all the great country musicians, which was the greatest marketing campaign you could ever come up with because there's guys to this day that still use that stuff, you know. And uh, it, he, was, he tried out a lot of different guitars, but the period I played with him, he was not playing acoustic stuff like he's famous for. He was playing electric guitar, and we had a three-guitar attack. It was a lot of triple leads. It was developed beyond belief, just triple leads. And then sometimes he'd go, let's do the second one we practiced. And the guys would go, oh, my God, they have to play all this stuff. But if you want to see that band, it's there's a, a Austin City Limits uh, concert footage of uh, us on YouTube in 1982. And it's, it's amazing. It's a great great performance on his part especially because he was at the height of his powers then you know he was using flat pick at that time doing the george benson style stuff so i didn't i rarely got to see him play the gut string stuff when i was there it just wasn't there then he went back to it later obviously i mean on those hillbilly buses especially back then it was nothing but fun everything was still pretty crazy back then partying and just and country music was in my opinion heading towards its last heyday which would have been the 90s so a lot of that stuff was in play. Got to open shows or headline shows with just about everybody. So I got it. Really expanded my my circle of friends and and also whatever it meant. My own personal notoriety, which helped me later. You know, he was pretty good about letting anybody play what they want unless he had specific stuff in mind. I remember him one time. I was getting a little too busy on a song, and he just looked at me and said, "Son, you're getting too cute. Let's." Let's have some stupid bass. Come on, man. So it was a fine line because it was a country band, but in a weird sort of way, it was a fusion band. You know, it was really a high-end musical experience. I mean, it was you could not play in that band and just be a regular country musician. You just couldn't do it. You had to have as many influences as possible. A lot of it was funk and rhythm and blues because... That's part of him that people tend to overlook, you know, because he was... I remember hearing... Uh, Amos Moses in 67 or 68 and thinking, what in the hell is that? It was on American Bandstand and I ran into the living room and looked and and here's this white dude playing like a black guy and singing like one and the song was great and then 
And I, I remember it wasn't a portent of anything for me because obviously I had no clue where my life was going to go at that point. But I remember thinking, this guy is really something else, you know? I mean, he's easily the, him and Chet are the two most influential guitar players in this. T- I think combined they invented modern guitar, country guitar. Oh, yeah. All, uh, yeah, all the way. They got, they won a Grammy a few years later for two guitar, a two guitar record they made. Yeah. They, they were friends to the end. Yeah. Everybody in that band ended up becoming major session players or one guy, one of the guys, one of the guitar players uh, is the band leader at the Grand Ole Opry House Band now. I mean, it just goes on and on. You know, everybody in that band was amazing. I learned a lot playing with those guys. On guitar, Kerry Marks, and then we had the Blackman Brothers, who were a bluegrass brother duo from Georgia playing fiddle and guitar and then banjo and guitar, respectively. And then Rick McClure on drums. Mike White on percussion and Bob Patan on uh, keyboards. The whole thing was beyond interesting for me because he ended up being my father-in-law for 13 years. And he's the grandfather of my son, Jerry, who is now the number one session drummer in Nashville. He's on every record on the radio. Now it's ludicrous, you know. So my perspective is a little bit different. I started dating his daughter and we agreed that I should leave the band. And I went on and, you know, and, in his defense about all that, I understood how he felt about having somebody in the band that was dating his daughter. He got me the gig with my second gig when when we agreed to part ways. He got me my second gig, which was with Chet Atkins. So there was no complaints from me anywhere about any of that. But, you know, tour buses are weird in the sense that everybody thinks we're part, riding down the road partying and listening to music and stuff. Man, most of the guys that play in those bands, music is 24-7 with them. You don't really hear much on the buses. You might hear people sitting and practicing, but thank God. Because, you know, you get off stage playing a loud show. The last thing you want to do is fire up the stereo, you know. So it's just nobody I've worked for had that going on. Nobody, you know. What were the stage volumes like with Jerry? Pretty loud. The guitar playing was really, it was it was rock and roll delivery for, for sure, you know. So with the PV amps that he was playing, what, you remember what particular ones? Um, the specials, I think that rings a bell, you know, the 130 specials or whatever they're called. And I had a big PV bass rig. Everybody was PV to hell, you know, it's like amazing. Um, Cause PV sort of revolutionized that whole thing of country guitar. They sounded pretty good. I mean, Brent Mason still uses them, man. I mean, you know, 130 specials, I think is what it is. You could throw them down a flight of stairs. You cannot kill a PV amplifier. I got a PV bass amp. I can sleep at night knowing that I've got a good bass amp still, and I don't play it anymore, but it's like, they're great, man. Fantastic. My wife and I, uh, his daughter got divorced in 96, and he died when, like, five or six years ago? I never got any animosity from him, really, you know, about all that stuff. He wasn't happy about it. He had, I mean, every father has different designs for their daughters other than marrying a touring musician, you know, so. But uh, he, uh, it was always great. You know, then my son became really successful and he he just looked at it like he had a little dynasty happening with all of us and it was great, you know. 